so glad that you are worshiping with us on this very first Sabbath of camp meeting. It's a wonderful time here. So if you are viewing with us today, we hope at some point this month, you're able to experience it live right here on campus. And we have a wonderful theme this year for 2022. It is entitled to believe or not to believe. And kind of in that spirit of believing and not believing, we're gonna play a game, uh, two, uh, two truths and a lie. Um, and we're gonna use that game for, for you to have an opportunity to get to know some of the pastors here. So this week we're fun. gonna start with Pastor Doug. Here, take a look. I identify as a garage slob. I am a closet artist, love to doodle, and I love salt on my fruit. So two of those are supposed to be truths and one a lie. I don't know about you, I need some time to think about it. I think yeah. they need some time. So let's think about it a little bit. We'll do a couple announcements and then we'll come back, all right? Okay. So take it away. It's a deal if I can even concentrate now on announcements. I think they're all lies though, by the way. Yeah, but okay. we'll, we'll figure that one out. Um, for our first announcement, we have a wonderful program here at the church that is called Grief Share. For any of you who have experienced loss and need a support or learn how to handle that, uh, we would encourage you to watch this video with Pastor Adrian Presley, who will give you more details about it. Happy Sabbath, friends. It's hard to believe that it's been three months since we ended our first Grief Share seminar this year. And now we're about to start our second one, which will begin in just two weeks. After the death of a loved one, you need support and encouragement. The Loma Linda University Church will present Grief Share, a virtual support group via Zoom, starting Friday, August 12th through November 4 of this year for 13 consecutive Fridays from 7 to 9 p.m. Grief Share is a special weekly seminar and support group designed to help you rebuild your life. Now, whether you lost a loved one recently or years ago, you're invited to attend. Registration is required, so please go to our website as soon as possible at lluc.org and look for Grief Share in featured events. This promises to be a time of compassionate caring and sharing. And next, our announcement is regarding another important ministry of this church, our Pathfinders and Adventures. You're seeing some footage of all the wonderful things that they do. The Pathfinders have already opened up the registration. There'll be a table out in the courtyard. You can get more information, but you can register between now and the end of the month. And then Adventures, you'll be able to start registering August 15. We really encourage you to check that out. Speaking of Pathfinders and children, we have a new Sabbath school that is starting out. This is for parents of children. And Jamie Stadola, who is the director of our care and counseling department is in charge of that. And she is here to bring you more information. Yes, hello. Um, we will be starting this Sabbath school in September and part of my team will be leading this. And so I would like to introduce you to Igor and Flora Milosavovic who will be leading this Sabbath school. Guys, tell us a little bit about this Sabbath school. Well, Jamie, uh, this takes us back to a few years ago. Do you remember when we had the double stroller and Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> the two other kids and we were dropping off at Sabbath Triple School. Triple stroller, yeah. Yeah, think back a little bit. What was Friday evening like? We were exhausted and we were looking to just have some time to reflect. And then Sabbath morning would come, we'd bring our children, either be in one class and one would go to the other. Yeah, yeah. And so we would think, is there anyone else? Are there other parents who feel the same way we do? Do they need some time to just uh, be together, pray, study God's word, and reflect on the week, and have some peace and quiet, and possibly fellowship with other parents? Right, and that's what this is about, isn't it? That's exactly what this uh, Sabbath school is about. For all the parents who feel the way we do, come and partner with us. So the Sabbath school will be starting September 10th. It's during Sabbath school time at 10.30 after you drop off your kids. Please come and join us for an oasis, a spiritual oasis, and to find support. We look forward to having you there. All right, we've had our time to think about it. They've had their time. Not First enough of all, time. Not <laughs> garage, enough. slob, true or false? Uh, I, I think, think false. 
That he's a slob in the garage? No, I, he said he's a garage slob. I don't think, I think he's neat in the garage. I don't know. And I, you've seen him doodle. I've seen him doodle. So we think that's true. He's a closet artist. It, it's somewhat legible. And then doodling. the salt and the fruit. <laughs> true or false? He has a sweet tooth. So you, you think? I, I think the lie may be that he adds salt to his fruit. Okay, so we're gonna have to decide here. I think we yeah. should agree. So garage Why is a lie. Why do we have to agree? <laughs> None of the rest of the world does. <laughs> so garage a lie or not? Yes or no? To you? Um, that he's a slob. You think that's true? That's true. Okay. So we're gonna go with salt. So salt is the lie. Okay. You're so gonna go with what? Okay. Yep. I'm gonna. If I'm wrong, I do not want to hear about this the rest of my life here. Well, we'll find out right now. Doug's gonna <laughs> let us know. Yep, you got it right. I don't like salt on my fruit. In fact, I think if the Lord wanted us to have salt in our fruit, he would have given us a salt shaker. So stop that. So there you yes. go. If I'd have stuck to my guys and insisted <laughs> that I was right, we would have both been wrong. Good call. Give me a... <laughs> well, Dougie <we're>... Fresh, <laughs> I know you better than you think I do. <laughs> well, Pastor Doug does so many things. We're going to talk about a moment. We've got a program this afternoon but talking about camp meeting in general. As yes. we've already mentioned, it's to believe or not to believe. That is the question. And this evening, we're going to talk about it in a moment, but we need to mention Veritas because that is a concert at the last week. September and the 3rd. That's correct. And tickets are being sold. You better get your seat fast. It's always a popular concert. So go to our website or you can go to the Ticketmaster. iTickets. iTickets. And then type in Veritas Concert. That's correct. And so then this evening, though, at 7 p.m., Pastor Doug, who hates salt on his watermelon, there is going to be a social <laughs> afterwards, by the way, there's Singspiration. With the watermelon. Bring your voices. <laughs> we did this a couple of camp meetings ago. It's a wonderful experience. We really encourage you to come out at 7 p.m. for Singspiration, and, and that's going to be followed by a watermelon feed, and Doug will not be putting salt on his watermelon. No, but bring your salt if you want it. And then we have one more announcement. We do in between our church service and the evening programming. We have a something new that an we're doing. An online program. It's an online program. You can go to watch live to get this. It's called More to the Story. And the thought behind that is each of the stories that we have each week, we've had to cut down to five to seven minutes. When we interviewed these individuals to hear their story, there was so much more to it. And so we wanted to give an opportunity for them to share more of their story, for you to be able to ask them questions, and for Pastor Randy to be able to share some more thoughts and expand on his topic for the week and his sermon. So this will be a one hour uh, time together from five o'clock to six o'clock. You go online, click watch live, and we'll have a discussion together. You can actually, I'll let you tell about that. You yeah, know if you about log on in the computer, yeah. then you can participate in the chat. And so you can ask Pastor Randy or the guests questions. Yeah. Um, if you watch on Roku, you won't be able to interact, but you can watch the program. So it'll be on our regular church website, but you need to do it on the computer. So uh, we encourage you to check that out. That's at 5 p.m. online. Well, that's our announcements for today. As always, we say go to our website, LOUC.org, for the latest information. We, once again, are so glad that you're joining us. We love you guys, and we hope that this Sabbath day is a huge blessing to each one of you.
Well, we'd like to welcome you to Camp Meeting 2022. We've got a lot going on. I'm really I'm going to be inviting Pastor Randy up. He wants to punctuate one of our ministries, and we've got a great announcement today from you, Reach. Thank you so much, Pastor Stu. It's wonderful to be back with you. I have missed you, and I'm delighted to be back among this community of faith that we call home. In the announcements, you saw Pastor Adrian talking about grief here. Our world today is in some real challenges, and many have experienced loss. Don't suffer that alone. Let me encourage you. Let me urge you to participate in this. We underline it again because registration ends this coming Monday evening. Don't suffer alone. Click on our website, sign up, and be a part of Grief Share. We have a very special ministry to announce today. We've been talking about it, actually, but today is the day it all begins, and I'm delighted to be able to be here to be a part of this Pastor Linda, our director for outreach, you reach ministry, we call it. Tell me what it is. We're very excited to announce our Redo Ministries, which is our homeless ministries. For the last couple of months, we've been having clinics. We partnered with the San Bernardino Spanish Church, and at their location, we've been having clinics where we're providing food, clothing, haircuts, hair washing, hygiene kits, shoes, and we're excited that now we get to add showers to that clinic. I hope that on the way in, or at least on the way out, yes, absolutely, that you will stop and take a look at what we are dedicating today. One of our members made a very generous donation to outreach. When we sat down with this individual and talked to them and laid out the dream, they said, that's what I would like it used for. And then, as you said, Adra has stepped in and helped us with the truck. So we're so excited that we have an ability to do one more ministry that will be relevant in the lives of people around us, the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters who struggle, and we can be a part of that. So when, Linda, when can people be a part of this? So our clinic runs twice a month, every other Sunday. Tomorrow will be the first Sunday that our shower trailer gets to be at the clinic. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up and participate, we invite you to do so. Right outside, our Renew Ministries coordinator, Israel Peralta, is out there. He can give you information on how to sign up. You can also take a look at the trailer, as Pastor Randy said. But tomorrow will be the first Sunday that it is out there, and it's from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. This is at the San Bernardino Spanish Seventh-day Adventist Church, correct? That's correct. Absolutely. Now, if you're here, you can stop there and you can sign up. What if somebody's viewing on the broadcast and they say, I want to be a part of that? How would that happen? If you're viewing online and you want to sign up, you can go to youreachlluc.com. You can sign up under Serve there and click on the Renew Ministries or any other You Reach ministry, and then you'll be able to sign up to volunteer. Absolutely. So we're delighted to be able, as I said, to inaugurate this ministry officially today, but we want to take a moment to dedicate it by prayer. We're going to ask God's blessing on this community, upon those who serve in this community, upon what we have been given, that we might be faithful with it and that we might make a difference in the world where we are. So would you join us as we pray together? Gracious God, we're so thankful to be to have the honor to be called your children. But, Lord, we recognize that that honor comes with responsibility. It comes with responsibility to those around us. Lord, we're also very grateful that you touched somebody's heart that made this possible, and then others who have made more possible, and then more who will make continuing ministry possible. We're thankful for that. So we bring this truck, this trailer, we bring our community in dedication to you today praying that we might be, by the power of your Holy Spirit, the heart and the hands of Jesus. Bless every act and every moment of ministry. And for this, we will praise and thank you. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Once again, we're so glad that you're here for this year's camp meeting. Whether you're viewing online at LLBN or right here in the sanctuary, welcome, and it's time to sing. Take it away, Doug.
Thank you, Pastor Stu. I want you to turn to your neighbor and look at them with a big grin and say, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. Won't you stand with us as we sing about the power in the blood? Please remain standing as we sing a favorite of mine. I heard an old, old story. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Jesus, 
sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood, beneath the cleansing blood. Amen. You may be seated. Let's give the Lord a big hand. I just love to hear you sing and clap in praise and honor to our God. It is so good to sing with you. Friends, we don't want you to miss this afternoon at 7 o'clock. Come back for some more. We're going to raise our voices. We never get to sing long enough. And tonight at 7, it feels like in the afternoon, tonight at 7, we want the sanctuary full of those who want to sing and raise their voices to Jesus. Amen. Bring the young ones so we can continue this beautiful tradition of our hymns. We'd like to ask the deacons to come forward now as we collect your tithes and offerings. And friends, I want to say thank you so much for supporting the ministries of this church. Everything from the budget to our outreach program, generational, and also the new building. You have been so faithful. Let's sing Blessed Assurance as the deacons come forward. Blessed Assurance this is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of privilege of speaking at an event where diff pastors from different denominations were preaching 
A gentleman I got to know was a Presbyterian minister named Leslie Holmes. I'll never forget what Dr. Holmes said to me. He said, preach to broken hearts because there's one in every pew. Sadly, that's true. As we come to this time of prayer today, we're going to invite you, those who wish to, to come down and join us in a garden of prayer. There are broken hearts here. It could be from your own experience, your family, a neighbor, a friend, whatever it is. Only you and God need to know that. I can tell you that if I wasn't leading, I'd be joining. So as we sing about God's great faithfulness to us, I want to invite you, if you have a special burden, a special need, if you have a broken heart, come down and join us down front for prayer. And if you're the early ones, come all the way on down to the sides and down to the front so others will have room as well. much as you're able to, I invite not only those in our garden of prayer, but our congregation to kneel for prayer. Gracious God, what a joy and what a privilege it is to come to you this morning in prayer. Many of us come with praise on our lips and gratitude in our hearts. We see your fingerprints on every hand in our lives and we want you to know how deeply grateful we are. But many others of us come with broken hearts, Lord. Come to join together in prayer. Sometimes we are bound together by the legacy of pain. Sometimes it is only by leaning on others that we can make it through today. And Lord, the reality is that you have chosen for us, the body of Christ, to be your heart and your hands in the world today. I pray that every single person who has come to this garden of prayer and whose heart and whose prayers and whose requests are being raised to you right now might know that you are with them. And if they can't feel your presence right now, Lord, let them feel the warmth of this body, of this community. We will believe for them on their behalf. We lift them up to you in prayer. I see friends in this garden of prayer, friends whose lives have been shared a bit with me, and I'm just so thankful to see them here. I pray that you would be an all-sufficient need to their request. Lord, we crave, we desire, we yearn for the filling of your Spirit. We want to walk with you in the world. We want an authentic relationship that whether it be lament or praise, whether it be anger or thanksgiving, we just refuse to stop talking to God. So, Lord, give us words for whatever our experience. Give us healing for whatever our pain. And give us joy in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. As a community, Lord, we ask and we thank you. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. And as we finish singing about God's faithfulness, I invite you to return to your seats.
reading this morning is found in Psalms chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Commit your way to the Lord, and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Trust in him, he will do this. My dad served in the National Guard in 1968 when Martin Luther King was assassinated. When I was about three months old, my dad became physically disabled, and PTSD wasn't understood as well at that time. And we were all struggling as a result <laughs> because he was supposed to be the provider for us. And there was no money coming in. My mom had to figure out how to go back to work. And so dad stayed home with us. But again, he was physically present, but emotionally gone. Being the youngest of four, I was the baby of the family. And my parents weren't really around for me. So I wanted to hang out with my siblings, but they didn't really want me around. It was very lonely. And this is where I really started to see God in my life, but I didn't know it was God at the time. There was this presence in my life that wasn't a person, but it was, it was there. And it was basically my companionship throughout my childhood. But I didn't know who or what that presence was. Fast forward years and years, my mom had heard about this math and science academy in Illinois, and it was a state-funded high school, and you'd apply like you were applying to college, and they would take students from all over the state. Also with that came people from all different religions, people who were atheists, people who were agnostic, people who were Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Wiccan, and my experience was often that the people who weren't Christian were the ones who were nicest to me, and the ones who said they were Christian oftentimes were more judgmental. And the atheists and the agnostics, there were many that spoke very negatively about the Bible. And it made me question like, who is God? And is God real? So now, fast forward to college, I'm in a class called History of Architecture and Decor. We get to this part in this class, and the teacher talks about Constantine's empire and all of the brutal killing of all these people. And this was Christianity. And I remember saying at that point in time, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. And in that moment, God spoke to me and said, but you wanna know the truth, right? I said, yes, I wanna know the truth. And he said, you are a Christian and I'm gonna show you. But at this point, I didn't want anything to do with God. I, I struggled with why wasn't God there fixing all the problems in life if he was really real. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna try life on my own the way the atheists and agnostics do. But when I made that choice to turn away from God, there was suddenly an emptiness. Go your own way. When I was at college, around that time I found out my parents had been getting involved with a church and they were really they're like, this church is teaching the Bible. And they started talking to me about Sabbath. The idea of not working on sundown Friday to sundown Saturday was completely incompatible with my life at the time. And the following spring, uh, my brother had returned a car to home to my parents' place, and I could have it now. When I got that car and brought it out to school, I was still struggling with whether I believed in God or not. And I remember saying, Lord, keep this car running until I can get it back home after graduation. So this whole thing with Sabbath happens with my mom, and she tells me to really study this out for myself and bring it to God and ask God if it's true or not. So I prayed, Lord, if this Sabbath thing is real, 
I need you to show me in a way that I will understand. You know that I can't believe something just because it's in a book and I can't believe something just because someone told me to believe it. I need to know from you that it's true. This car was a total rust bucket. I mean, it had a hole rusted into the trunk. I had to patch it with a piece of metal. <laughs> it was rusting everywhere. And I just needed it to get me through my last bit of time at school. Every time I would take the car someplace on Friday night or Saturday that was not with keeping Sabbath, the car would flood out and leave me sit. Anytime on Friday night or Saturday that I was just going to a friend's place and hanging out for a bit, the car worked fine. The car had a bit of a gas smell. So I took it in and the guy comes out and is holding this. He says, ma'am, do you know what this is? I said, it's my gas tank, right? And he's like, yeah. You see this pipe right here? This was rusted off. Like there was no, it was not connected. He's like, I don't even know how your car was still running. Part of me knew beyond a doubt that God was real and that God was doing this. But another part of me was still like, this can't be real. It, which am I going to believe? Am I gonna believe what I know to be true? Or am I going to believe other ideas that are being taught to me? Because walking with one foot on each side of the fence isn't working. It was a struggle still to figure out which way to go. Fast forward the next semester, I'm learning what it is to be a Christian. My mom sent me and actually all my siblings a little box of books for Christmas. And when I read See With New Eyes by Ty Gibson, it was almost like a matrix moment in my life in how I understood the world to operate and function how all the things that people had been teaching me about the Bible and about God's character that was negative, all of that was wrong. All of that was consistent with the character of Satan, not with the character of God. And I'd open up a scripture, I was reading Psalm 37, verse four, commit your way to the Lord and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Trust in him and he will do this. And the tears just started flooding from my eyes. That was the promise that he made to me. And it was that same relationship, it was that same presence all through my life that had been leading me and guiding me. And hear that voice had spoken this scripture to me that I didn't even know was scripture at the time. I had never read it in God's word. And here it was, right in front of me. And at that point, I knew that this was God all along. He had his hand in my life from my earliest days. I just had to believe he was who he was. Oh, and then that, that red car, I got it home, and a month later, the transmission fell out of it. God kept it going until I got it home. The scene is the East Room of the White House. Two men are going to speak, and two men are going to become the focus of the nation's and also of international attention. The first is President William Jefferson Clinton. The second is Francis Collins, a geneticist physician. He's been leading the Human Genome Project, and they are here today to announce the completion of the mapping of the human genome. It's an incredible accomplishment, worthy of attention around the world. Both men will speak, but it is what President Clinton had to say in one part of his speech that became the focus of much attention. Francis Collins tells about it in the open paragraphs and pages of his book, The Language of God. I want to read to you that brief part of the speech that became the focus of attention from President Clinton and then read to you some words from Francis Collins about that. Here are the president's words. Today we are learning the language in which God created life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, and the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. Well, that was a bit problematic for some. What was happening? Collins' words. What was going on here? Why would a president and a scientist charged with announcing a milestone in biology and medicine feel compelled to invoke a connection with God? 
Aren't the scientific and spiritual worldviews antithetical, or shouldn't they at least avoid appearing in the East Room together? What were the reasons for invoking God in these two speeches? Was this poetry, hypocrisy, a cynical attempt to curry favor from believers or to disarm those who might criticize this study of the human genome as reducing humankind to machinery? No, not for me. Quite the contrary, for me, the experiencing of sequencing the human genome and uncovering this most remarkable of all texts was both a stunning scientific achievement and an occasion of worship. Many will be puzzled by these sentiments, assuming that a rigorous scientist could not also be a serious believer in a transcendent God. This book aims to dispel that notion by arguing that belief in God can be an entirely rational choice and that the principles of faith are, in fact, complementary with the principles of science. What's going on? A scientist at the top of his game invoking God? A believer at the top of his game in the secular world of science. And then saying, you can have both. Well, it drives us to a question. A question that echoes from the pages of Shakespeare's works. It was Prince Hamlet who asked the question, contemplating the, the, the difficulty and the darkness of life and the possibility of suicide. He asked the question, to be or not to be? That is the question. We pick up on echoes from Hamlet, and we change the topic to one that is just as critical. And this camp meeting series, we will ask it. To believe or not to believe? That is the question. So you have a friend. And that friend has looked at you incredulously and said, God? You believe in God? Seriously? And then comes the more piercing part of the question, just three letters long. Why? Now, you've had enough conversations with this friend to know his objections, her reservations about faith. You know what they'll say. You can't prove God to me. Furthermore, I don't need some heavenly being in the sky telling me how to live my life. After all, look at all the suffering in the world. And furthermore, if God does exist, why doesn't he talk to us now, not in some dusty old book on a forgotten shelf? And then comes the real nub of the issue. And look at organized religion, that that you belong to. Look at all the damage it has done throughout history and in the world. What about that? So those are the objections your friend raises. And those are the issues we're going to try to engage in the coming weeks. We're going to nibble around the edges and see if we can't find fruit. But as we begin, we first must state something about our hearts and our attitudes. Because people like me, religious people, have done untold damage to the cause of Christ by our arrogance, our smugness, and our condemnation too many times of the people around us. We've done great damage. So we have to first begin with the attitude of our hearts and souls, at least recognizing that had we walked in the footsteps, had we stood in the shoes, had we experienced the losses that some of the people who object have, we would likely be exactly where they are. It calls for humility and grace. In fact, I'm going to ask you if you would do something with me. I'd like to do it every single week of camp meeting, all five weeks. I'd like to adopt a verse as our North Star for guiding our conversations. 
It's a verse that appears in the first letter to Peter, chapter 3. So we're going to reach back into the history of Christian worship and reach over into the worship of some of our liturgical friends. And I'm going to ask if you are going, would be willing to stand with me every week one time and read this verse together. You up to it? All right. Would you stand? We're going to put it up here on the screen. It's a text from 1 Peter chapter 3. And here we go. Let's read it aloud together. Worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I hope that you might with me be willing to adopt that as our North Star passage. Gentle, respectful, but keeping our conscience clear, meaning we do speak what's in our mind and heart. So your friend says, prove God to me. Prove it. And we take a breath, say a prayer, and speak the truth. I can't prove God to you. It's impossible to prove God. Furthermore, I can't even say I have utter certainty. Because the truth is, the book we read does not ask for those two things. That is not that to which we are called. We sometimes still experience doubt. We sometimes still have questions. Your friend says, well, then what is your book asking? Our book is asking faith. In fact, I love, it's one of the most simple statements of Scripture about faith. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, listen to what it says. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see, this is what the ancients were commended for. In other words, all those heroes of God, this is the kind of faith they experienced. What's curious about it, it's confidence in what we hope for. In other words, there's a confidence within our being, and it's assurance about what we do not see. There's something outside of and above us that also assures us. So it's what's internally and what's externally that meets together and issues forth in this virtue called faith. You know the picture I get as I read Scripture about faith? This kind of faith? That it is a virtue that develops as we look at what available evidence we have. We thoughtfully approach it. We sort it through. We ask our questions. After all, does not something that is true deserve to have questions asked? We ask our questions, we sort through the evidence, and by the time we're done, we then make a choice to say, this is that in which I place my faith. Prove God to me, says your friend. I can't prove God, but I can talk to you about why I have faith. So let's begin with one reason, one reason for belief. I go to Psalm, the book of Psalm, the ancient hymn book of Israel, chapter 19. You can almost picture David, maybe as a youth, out on the mountainsides in the Judean wilderness, vast and open and silent, being there at night and taking in the immensity of space. And that sometime after that experience, he sits down and scratches out these words that we now read. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. 
Do you see what David is saying? The heavens proclaim, the skies display, the voiceless voice speaks, the wordless message has gone out. All about God. Are these just the poetic ponderings, the mystical musings of a pre scientific shepherd poet? Or is there something here? I have to be honest with you and tell you that I've been thinking about and praying about our time together in this first Sabbath for many months. Because I want to talk to you about something that I know nothing about. I am not a scientist nor the son of one. And so I have spent months reading, reading, taking in, trying to understand, asking questions, trying to open my mind. I have been awed and stunned and struck dumb with questions at times, sorting through this reality about which Francis Collins spoke when he said, there are credible reasons for belief, even as a rigorous scientist. So out of the time I've spent, I've chosen only one, just one reason which to me is profoundly credible. There are so many more. I'll tell you one other thing I've learned in my many hours of reading, and that is that I have barely scratched the surface of this topic. So, what I present to you today is what is often spoken of as the argument of fine-tuning. The argument of fine-tuning. Here's what it says very simply. It says that the universe, not the planet, but the universe is so finely, so precisely tuned that to change it even in the most simple of ways would not ever have allowed the universe to exist or would bring it to an end right now, including us on planet Earth. Furthermore, that the fine-tuned realities of the universe are such that allow for life on this planet called Earth. That we who sit here today are able to be here today, are able to be alive today, to think about this, to ask these questions, because the entire universe is so finely tuned. So let me read you the words of one author who gathers together some of the different themes and topics and questions and answers, puts them onto paper. He writes this, What is especially remarkable about the fine-tuning argument is that the more time passes, the stronger it gets because science discovers more and more examples of it. So it is one thing to say, as the scientist Carl Sagan did, that there are two parameters necessary for life, and Earth just happens to meet both of them. It would be the same if there were five necessary parameters or ten. We might still be able to see Earth's having met these parameters as a matter of simple good luck. But as the decades have passed and science has uncovered scores and scores and then hundreds of examples of such perfect fine-tuning, the odds become far too astronomical to dismiss as luck or coincidence. The overwhelming impression is that the burgeoning welter of perfect coincidences has mounted to a level impossibly beyond anything we can put down to coincidence so that even the most hostile atheists must at least wonder whether it is all precisely as it is, precisely because it was intentionally designed to be that way. Fine-tuning. Paul Davies, Arizona State University, physicist, agnostic in matters of God, talks about the 
perfect fine-tuning of the fu four fundamental ver forces that hold the universe together. The gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. F perfectly fine-tuned, says Davies, to keep the universe intact and to allow for life to exist on our planet. As he talks about those, I want you to listen to what he says. Again, he's not pushing God. He's agnostic on this. But listen to Davies' words. It is hard, he writes, to resist the impression. It's hard to resist the impression that the present structure of the universe, apparently so sensitive to minor alterations in the numbers, has been carefully thought out. So what he's saying is, has it been carefully thought out? When I look at the numbers, it's hard to resist that impression. The seemingly miraculous concurrence of numerical values that nature has assigned to her fundamental constants must remain the most compelling evidence for an element of cosmic design. So if I could use my own words to try to capture his... It appears that he's saying, when I look at the numbers, when I look at the realities, the four fundamental forces, they're fine-tuning. I have to tell you, it's hard to resist the impression of some kind of design in this. And then about right about there, it gets truly stunning. The astrophysicist Hugh Ross in writing about the balance between the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force, says this, At certain early epochs in cosmic history, the universe's mass density must have been as finely tuned as one part in 10 to the 60th power. Now, we're going to come back in a moment to talk about the size of one part in 10 to the 40th power. It's a number that you can't grasp must have been as finely tuned as one part in 10 to the 60th power to allow for the possible existence of physical life at any time or place within the entirety of the universe. This degree of fine-tuning is so great that it's as if, right after the universe beginning, someone could have destroyed the possibility of life within it by subtracting a single dime's mass from the whole of the observable universe or adding a single dime's mass to it. Just let that sit there. A dime. You know the size of a dime. So what Davies is saying is, if that amount of mass had been added or taken away, could very well have destroyed the possibility of life anywhere in the universe. And then Ross uses an illustration, which helped me with my non-scientific mind. He said, imagine the continental contiguous United States. You got that picture in mind? Now get quarters to cover the entire continental contiguous United States. And we like Canada, so let's add them in. We now cover all of Canada with quarters. And oh, there's another state, Alaska. Let's cover all of Alaska with quarters. And we love our neighbors to the south, so let's cover all of Mexico with quarters and halfway into Central America, all covered with quarters. Numbers start to bend your mind. Then he says, keep adding quarters, keep piling them up until in that entire area of this continent, quarters are piled up high enough to cover Mount McKinley, some 20,000 plus feet high. Quarters over the entire area. And now, multiply that by 12. Now the quarters are up to 240,000 feet. And then multiply that by 50. Now they're 240,000 miles out, bumping into the moon. But no, don't worry, nobody lives there. That's the height of the quarters. Pardon me, the dimes. I'm growing here, inflation. <laughs> of the dimes. And then do one other thing. Now do the same exact thing 
on one billion other continents. One billion. And when you're done, tell a friend, somewhere in there is a red dime. Find it, extract it, and everything is over. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Are those just the poetic ponderings, the mystical musings of a pre-scientific shepherd poet? It's mind-numbing. So there are four men. They're called the New Atheists who have spoken and written prolifically about the damage that they believe religion has caused to the world. And friends, don't get your back up because they have some valid points. We'll talk about that later on. It's time we own where our faith has gone wrong and seek to reflect the love of Jesus So the four atheists, the new atheism it's called, Christopher Histon, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and and, uh, Dennis, uh, the other one slips in my mind. The new atheist, very outspoken at times, very aggressive, and at times very angry. So they've gone back and forth, back and forth with with people of faith, at times in angry, angry, volatile discussions, at other times in, in more thoughtful ways. So somebody asked Christopher Hitchens, put a camera on his face, and asked him a question. Some have surmised later that that maybe it was an unguarded moment for Hitchens. By the way, after first service, one of you scientists told me the same thing has now happened with Richard Dawkins. But in this case, Hitchens. Camera on him and asked him, okay, you've gone through all of this. You've written, you've, you've debated, you believe. So tell me. What is the most convincing argument from the other side? In other words, when you're contesting whether or not there's a God, what does the other side say that maybe gives you a little bit of pause? I want to read you Hitchens' words. Here's how he answered. It is the fine-tuned argument, the fine-tuning, that one degree, well, one degree, one hair of difference, and his voice trailed off. Even though it doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, you have to spend time thinking about it, working on it. It's not a trivial argument. We all say that. When he says we all say that, he's referring to himself and his four colleagues. The fact that one small infinitesimal change in the universe could have prevented life. That, he said, that's the one with which we struggle. So as I've been reading, as I've been thinking about this, thinking about dimes, not quarters, dimes, it's almost impossible to do so without wondering, where do we fit in? In the vast panoply of the sky, where are we? This place where there actually is life. So I want to use an illustration. It's not perfect. Just go with me. But it was helpful to me. Maybe it will be to you. So I want you to imagine that we we get in the space shuttle, and we travel back. We travel back, back, back as far away as we can from the universe as it is now known. I I realize, not possible, but just hang with me. We get so far back that the universe is spread out before us, and we take a picture. And then we come back to Earth. We go down to Costco. We take our little disc. We say, we got a picture on here. Wonder if you could print it. And they say, yeah, we'll do that for you. Well, we got a special request. We would like you to print it on a piece of photographic paper 
the size of the United States. So we would like to roll it out from the lapping shores of Santa Monica all the way to Hudson Bay on the east. We want to roll it out from the northernmost port parts of North Dakota border with Canada all the way down to the humid valleys of Texas. The entire country covered by this picture. They gulp, recover, and say, we'll do it. It's going to cost you a quarter. <laughs> it's going to cost you, but we'll do it. And so they do, and the day comes when they're done, and it's rolled out. As we look at what's beneath our feet, galaxies and stars and suns and worlds and space, a lot of space, we can't help but ask, where are we? Where do we fit? And so we get an astronomer world-class astronomer, can you show us where we are? I'll do it. It's going to take a while. It spends a few days, a few weeks, until finally he has it sorted out, says, come on, get in the car, and we begin to drive. And the universe is flashing by on both sides of the car. We drive and drive until finally we stop. He surveys the area. He gets out of the car, walks, paces off, continues to survey two or three hours until finally he stops, stops right there, center, right outside Dallas, Texas. <laughs> he stops there. And he says, everybody gather around. So we gather around. He gets down on his knees. He says, come in. I want you to see. When we're all in, he points to a little dot. He points to a piece of lint on the face of the universe. He says, you see that dot? The size of a pencil lead? That's our sun. Our world doesn't appear. It's too small. Fine-tuned. The universe. That life exists there. The astronomer, mathematician, physicist, Michael Gillen, talks about these things and talks about the period of time in our history when we were searching for, for, for life outside of this planet. He said for a period of time it was thought that there, there, would, there must be a lot of life out there. If there's only two conditions necessary for life to exist, there must be a great deal of it. But in the decades as the search has gone on, all we've heard is crickets. Gillen writes about this. He says, in a paper submitted to the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, the authors concluded, we find a substantial probability that we are alone in our galaxy and perhaps even in our observable universe. If any little green men, says Gillen, do exist out there somewhere, the authors add, they're somewhere over the rainbow, quite possibly beyond the cosmological horizon and forever unreachable. Remarkably, says Gillen, the Bible agrees. It tells us that sentient beings do exist beyond the cosmological horizon. One of them in particular visited Earth 2,000 years ago, and his stay is documented in striking detail in the most widely read book in human history. An ancient tome that has survived centuries of scrutiny by countless skeptics and is today supported by volumes of well-documented historical and physical evidence. A book that squarely takes on the question, are we alone, and gives us the definitive answer, no, we are not. So your friend asks, God... You believe in God? Seriously? Prove it to me. And you take a breath and say a prayer and remember our guiding North Star passage. And you humbly say, 
I can't prove it to you. I even have doubts at times. But I can tell you this. I have looked at every piece of evidence that I can find and have found so much of it to be credible. And then, as I have wrestled with evidence that is credible, I've also listened to the poetic ponderings, the musical musings of an ancient shepherd poet. And at the end of all that, I've made a choice and I have placed my faith in God. Amen. And then, maybe you should add this. Maybe you should say to your friend, could I ask you a favor? Can I borrow a dime? <laughs> Gracious God, no wonder the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies reveal the work of His hand. Lord, you've created us with minds to think, to ask, and to choose. Lord, thank you. And receive us as we place our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, join us online. Go to our website to continue the story.
Hello, everybody. Yes, it's me again, here with greetings. Wonderful family members and dear friends from here and there, enjoy now. On the top of my list today are Martha and David Loger, right here in Los Angeles, married 28 years. Congratulations, there they were, there they are. Hello, dear Dixie Roberts, over in Fernandina Beach, Florida, 88 years old lady, congratulations, as I get to see you there with daughters Sandy and Patty. Alan and Karen Dortch, Laurel, Maryland, marking 59th anniversary. Congratulations, you two. Glad to see you and with family as well. Joan Berg, Westminster, Colorado, 90 years, lady. Congratulations, your flowers with your son and grandson. Bill Wilson, Ultawa, Tennessee, 96th birthday for you, I understand. Congratulations, sir, former hospital administrator and good friend of my friend, Bill Stone. Brenda Moore, dear Brenda, musician right here at Loma Linda. Congratulations on your birthday. Glad to see you at graduation time and especially with daughter and grandbaby. Gordon and Jeannie Dinning, Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. 56th anniversary for you two. Yes, there you were and there you are. Hi, Darlene. Darlene Cooley, Chino Valley, Arizona. There you are with Aneen and Valora and then with Lee and son Desmond. Congratulations, Darlene. Bill Hohensey, Portland, Oregon. Congratulations on another birthday, man. Dog lover, I can see, but mainly love Ruby, your dear wife. Julie and Don, Julie and Dan Luce, Walla Walla, Washington, 40th anniversary. Dear, dear friends, congratulations as I see you were and you are. Elaine Fleming, Lodi, California. Hello, Elaine. Congratulations on another birthday, and all I can say, happy grandma. John Elloway, Dr. John, Novato, California, 90th birthday, sir. Congratulations, always glad to be reminded. Hello, Darlene Dickinson, Camarillo, California, 85th birthday for you, Darlene. Wow, and another happy grandma, and you do get around. Lamont Murdoch, right here, Loma Linda. Congratulations, Dr. Murdoch, on another birthday and glad to see you with dear Becky. Ricardo and Audrey Graham, Stockton, California. 45th anniversary for you two, I understand. Good friends of all of us. Congratulations, you two. Robert and Martha Natiuk, Battleground, Washington. 56th anniversary for you. Yes, there you were. And there you are. Ruben Yanez Vega, right here, Loma Linda. Congratulations, man, on graduating with two master's degrees, and your family is rejoicing as we all do. Patsy Sogioka, a part of University Family and Gathering Place Sabbath School. Happy birthday, Patsy, and glad to see you with your beautiful daughter. Tony Zuccarelli, right here, Loma Linda. Folks, this gentleman is probably the best church usher I have ever met. And there he is with dear Sherry and a grandbaby. Marklin Retzer, San Marcos, California. Yes, the Retzer may, name means that you're Daryl Retzer's son and Melody's brother, as you had a wonderful excursion in Yosemite lately. Nona Lyman Nordby, Bellevue, Washington. Hello, Nona. Happy birthday. And so glad to see you there with dear George. Stan Jensen, Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. Good friend. And there with your oldest daughter. Wow, how neat to have children. And then I see you with another friend, Don Davenport, and a mutual friend of the two of you. 
And speaking of Don, happy birthday, Don. Glad to see you whenever and there with dear Carol. Hello, Jim Weller. Lalon, the Philippines, where you're the academy principal and graduate school professor at the university. Congratulations on another birthday. Glad to see you with dear Ginger. And I know recently you were on vacation in Arizona. Dean and Vera Davis, South Lancaster, Massachusetts, 66th anniversary for you two. Warmest congratulations. And I can tell it's been a great, great experience for you two. Vicki and Ken Salerno, New Plymouth, Idaho, 45th anniversary. There they were, and there they are. Yes, yes. And Vicki is my niece. Congratulations, you two. D. Litton Whited, Front Royal, Virginia. Yes, I would put thumbs up if I got a good health report, too. And there you are with artist husband, Michael. Julia Salerno, Spokane, Washington. Congratulations on another birthday, Julia. There you are with that violin that we love to hear so much. And your three children whom we love to see so much. Kitty Evans, Burleson, Texas. Congratulations on another birthday, lady, as I see you there with husband Chris. Nicole Modell, Camarillo, California, another of my favorite musicians. And there she is with her parents, her brother, and a friend. Angie Lipscomb Armstrong, Keene, Texas. Hello, Angie. Wow, have we some history. Clear back to Eugene, and glad to see you there with husband Keith. Hello, Don Olson, Newport Beach, California. Man, we love to be in touch with you, Don, and to be with dear Jody as well. Lance Taggart, Visalia, California. Another family member, congratulations on your birthday, Lance, and glad to see you with dear Lori. Well, blessings to all of you, and I look forward to another week, and I'll be with you.